Hello everybody and welcome back to the Yorkshire Air Museum. We are standing next to our old friend Friday the 13th, a Halifax heavy bomber of World War II in service with the Royal Air Force. Now in the first episode we talked a little bit about the history of the Halifax but today we're doing something very special. We're gonna go inside and show you just how this magnificent aircraft works. All right so getting into the Halifax, a little bit tricky. We have the main access hatch on the back side of the fuselage, just between the main wing and the tail section. And now you obviously have to imagine me being in a full kit, uh, parachute on, my uh, big boots, my big uniform, uh, protecting me against the cold in the, uh, in the altitudes that Halifax would be flying at. I obviously don't have this kind of kit on me at the moment, but even without this kit, it's a little bit tricky, let's say. So I'm going to use these stairs, I'm going to try to get in and not make a fool out of myself. Now one of the important things here to note is that there is, the hatch actually opens inwards. So it's right above me now. So if I just stick my head through and go up immediately, I'm going to bang my head. So I can't do that. I have to go through and sort of squeeze myself diagonally into the aircraft. So as you squeeze into the aircraft, you're presented with a choice, either you move to the back if you're the tail gunner or if you're not the tail gunner and any of the other uh, six crew members you move up front you do this obviously wearing all your kit then in the midsection you are presented with the dorsal turret and the way it is positioned right now is actually ideal for moving through this is, gives this nice little room well room um, to, to move through you do this you get to a certain kind of uh, passenger space area as you might want to call it and move up, over, presented with a couple of bips and bobs, fire extinguishers and all that good stuff. Then you climb over this area. Once again, you got to be a little bit careful where you step on. You've got a uh, pigeon cage to your left. No, I'm not kidding. And then you've got your first crew station here. This is the flight engineer, followed up immediately by the pilot. It's a little bit of a climb to get up there, but you know, you got to do what you got to do. The wireless operator sits right below him and over where the camera is, there's the navigator and the bomb aimer. Right, we're going to talk about the commander section first. This is obviously where the pilot is going to be sitting. Now, a word of warning, when they designed this plane, they obviously didn't have in mind that somebody would come around in 2018 and film this station. So it's a little bit tight and it's somewhat of a awkward shot to make. However, we're going to give it a go. We obviously have the pilot seat over here. Uh, this can be adjusted in height and not much more. And then to his bottom right, we immediately have a couple of levers. Now the first lever right here, this is the undercarriage, down and up obviously. And when the pilot uh, activates this, he will go to a indicator over here where it tells him whether the gear is up or down and locked. Then the second lever here is the flaps indicator. The flaps are obviously in multiple positions, down and up. And to make sure that the flaps are set in the proper, uh, proper setting, he can check them over here and there he sees the uh, angle of the flaps. And the last lever we have over here is the bomb bay doors, which the pilot himself can open. Um, there's just a little bit of a pull. And to make sure that these things are opened, he will have to check these dials right here. We obviously have the markings open, unlocked and shut. And we have also a bomb jettison lever right there. One last thing over here actually, the trim tabs, elevator trim tabs. And uh, he can check the elevation of the trim tabs on this dial here. Right, moving on to the overall seating arrangement. Obviously he sits here and this is his yoke, his uh, steering stick and this handle right here is the uh, the brakes and there should be a handle right here. I'm not actually quite sure if it would be this one or if it would be an additional one here. Maybe it's a little bit different on the Mark III uh, for internal communications with the crew. Now, moving on towards uh, the left side here, we have autopilot uh, instruments and then we go towards the dashboard. Now, first thing that is presented here is a compass. He has a second direction finding compass over here, as well as somewhat of a homing beacon indicator here. The dashboard that he has here is pretty much good for him to do instrument flying. We have the speedometer, uh, obviously calculating everything in miles an hour. We have the artificial horizon. 
we have the climb indicator, we have altitude given in feet, we have a uh, direction uh, finder thingy, and we have a side slip and turn indicator right here. Now, moving on towards the engine control settings. We obviously find ourselves presented with a massive, and I'll just wait for my cameraman to squeeze through, um, we have a massive engine control uh, lever setting here. These top ones are for the throttle. These bottom ones are for the propeller speed uh, from these uh, constant uh, speed propellers. Obviously the Halifax Mark III that we're filming in here is operating with Bristol Hercules radial engines. And below that we have control levers for the mixture and for the superchargers. Now, should one of the engines or multiple of the engines fail and he has to feather the prop, he goes all the way on top and you find yourself with four different buttons and you obviously hit the corresponding button and then you feather your prop. And you also have at this point the ability, or if you want to do it another point in time, that's fine as well, uh, to do some of the navigational lighting and internal lighting for the position. And the last lighting, the bits and bobs here, is over here for the landing lights. And next to that one, we also have another direction finding indicator. Over in the back here, this is where the pilot can read the uh, revolutions per minute for his engines. And then for the last couple of things that I would like to explain, we have a clock, very important. We have air pressure and we have the pressure in the brakes. And that pretty much rounds us up for the pilot section of this aircraft. I, ho I hope everything uh, was clear. Obviously, it's not made for filming, as I said before. Um, one thing should be noted, however. The pilot, even though he has all these instruments for the actual engines, is not able to operate the engines himself. He actually needs the flight engineer, and that's where we're going to right now. All right, so we are in the uh, flight engineer's position, and... Uh, he actually shares this position, although it's predominantly his position, he does share this position with the navigator, but more on that later. Now, the flight engineer acts as sort of a co-pilot or a, oh my God, the pilot was hit, who's gonna fly the aircraft sort of person. And the flight engineer was given some rudimentary training, rudimentary pilot training, in order to at least bring the aircraft home. Um, was he able to land? Probably. But whether the landing was a good one, you never know. Any landing you can walk away from is a good landing, I guess. Right, his primary job was checking on the engines and then keeping them running. We have everything here that is required to do that. First of all, we've got the fuel tank content um, dials here. There's a lot of them and he has to keep an eye on them. Obviously, fuel tanks get hit, they leak, and that's a big problem, but he can transfer the fuel with some fuel transfer pumps right here. Now, above the fuel tank contents, we have the fuel pressure, and he also has warning lights, telling him which engine is a bit problematic. Uh, beyond that, we have the oil pressure. Again, that pressure has to be in a certain interval in order to the, for the engine to operate correctly. And beyond that, uh, to the left and to the right, we have the temperature, the oil temperature, and of course, the cylinder head temperature of the uh, the engines. Now the good thing about radial engines is they're not really requiring uh, liquid cooling. They only require oil and cylinder head temperature um, uh, cooling. Um, so this is a good thing for radials, but still you have to keep the keep an eye on everything. And if your engine does get hit, there might be uh, well you might fly home with uh, one engine less. Um, that really rounds up up on this station here. There's a few bits and bobs I want to show off later. Um, but I think it's time to go to the navigator's position. Before we do that, however, people always talk about armor in World War II aircraft. Now, I made a video about that specifically, uh, kind of dispelling the myth of these armored panels that people say can find themselves in all manner and sorts of aircraft during World War II. There were aircraft that were very well armored, but the majority weren't. Now, in the Halifax, there is some armor uh, left, right and center in the aircraft. There's some armor for the engine. There's a little bit of armor in the back for uh, the tail controls and um, also for the crew. One of these crew ar uh, armor 
it can be found right behind the flight engineer. There is a six millimeter armored panel right here, which will protect him against most calibers at most ranges. Also considering the fact that the rounds actually have to travel through the interior of the aircraft and lose a lot of their potency right there. Um, another armored part of this aircraft, it's not really armor, but the bar is a bulkhead between the flight engineer and the pilot. And the pilot sits more or less where the camera is right now. And that gives the pilot a little bit more extra protection. And above that bulkhead, we have armored glass between these two positions. It allows the pilot to look over the flight engineer's shoulder, if he can do that, and the flight engineer to look over the pilot's shoulder and check on him as well. Uh, but it does actually protect the pilot as well. Now, for the navigator, what does he have to do in this position? Well, there's an observation dome to the top with a sextant. And this is very helpful for him to, well, find the position of the aircraft at any given point in time, especially at night when he finds himself stranded in enemy territory and he doesn't exactly know where he is. So here's the observation dome with a sextant. It's powered by a power supply down there and essentially looks through here and does his job. Uh, hopefully finds his position and can get the aircraft home. Now there should be an armored glass panel for this observation dome as well, but we can't find it on this, uh, on this uh, refurbished machine but there should be one, just so you know. Right, we find ourselves in the wireless operator spot. He obviously operates the radios. And you know what? For the first time in the Halifax, I'm actually sitting comfortably. The uh, cameraman is not having such a good time. Anyway, receiver, transmitter. The receiver is a Type T1155, and the transmitter is a Type T1154. And these are obviously used to keep contact with the formation and with ground crews. Beyond that, well, there's a little bit of modern stuff in the position as well, but he has a Morse code um, instrument that he can uh, use for, uh, for the communication. And beyond that, there really isn't all that much to say about this position. It's really just a radio operator who is a very important fellow of a Halifax crew, but that's really his job. He's just there for communications. He does have a window with a blind that he can close and open. Uh, for the purposes of making this shot here, we obviously close that. And for the rest, well, he's having a comfortable ride in a really magnificent aircraft. That's it. Let's move on to uh, the next position. All right, so we finally find ourselves in the navigator position. And obviously the navigator navigates and he makes sure uh, uh, to that the bomber reaches its destination, that it gets back and that the crew knows where it is at any given point in time. Now here we have a fairly well restored, actually really nicely restored navigator's position and even with the table and a map. And apparently there is a course plotted here and apparently today's mission is Zwolle in the Netherlands. So yeah, we're bombing the Netherlands. Anyway, uh, all these bips and bobs here, all these machines are for navigation. Uh, we've got the ARI system, which is a parabolic navigational system. It has a range of roughly 400 miles, which allowed crews to uh, navigate towards, um, well, the Third Reich, to Germany. Um, however, because Germany actually did scramble and try to jam these kind of uh, navigational systems, it didn't really work anymore beyond the Netherlands, really. But for today's mission, apparently everything's fine. Um, the, this system, this RE system, actually allowed the bomber to navigate towards the target, even in completely poor and horrible weather conditions, within a two-mile uh, radius of the target. So you didn't have pinpoint accuracy, but for the time, that was actually pretty good. Now for the navigator, um, that really is all his job. He has a nice little lamp here that he can use obviously to plot his courses. He has all his little instruments, um, rulers, pens and all that good stuff. And below him, there is in fact an escape hatch. So he's one of the few people in this, in this um, uh, bomber that uh, has a straight way out of the aircraft. And next to that escape hatch, there's also a camera, which we're gonna be showing you. Um, where you can take pictures from, well, your bombs falling to the ground. And that really is all there is to say about this position. There's a little bit of a bench here that he can use to sit on. Um, here we go. We can fold that open slightly. I'm not gonna go complete with it. And below that, there would also be his parachute. And by the way, just so you know, the parachute over here, that's the one for the uh, flight, uh, for the wireless operator. And uh, yes, these 
uh, parachutes were not worn while they were on duty during these bombing missions. They put them on once they had to put them on. Otherwise, it would simply be uh, too obstructing. Um, but yeah, that is the navigator's position uh, taken care of. Let's have a look at the bomb aimer. All right, so welcome to the Bombardier's position. Once again, very awkward to film. Uh, but yeah, he would be lying here, looking down his bomb site, trying to hit something that, uh, well, he wanted to have blown up. Uh, for self-defense purposes, there is a Vickers K-Gun up front. There we go. And uh, we have also some ammo drums on the, on the side panels here. Now, for him actually being able to uh, successfully complete his mission, he obviously has to use uh, the uh, bomb aiming station. And uh, the main panel finds itself to the, his right with all the uh, little indicators that he requires to set the bomb. He also, to his left, in fact, has uh, some idea of where his aircraft is going. Once again, a very awkward shot to make. And uh, he has a couple of maps over there and uh, some uh, box bear lamps. Um, overall, his job really is only uh, one of self-defense and getting the bombs on target. It's a very, very uh, difficult job, obviously. These guys were trained, expertly trained for the time, trying to get the bombs as close to the target that, uh, as, as possible. Uh, however, uh, when you look at how they're positioned here, it's actually, I've got to say, a fairly comfortable position. Um, but you don't want to be lying here or doing your job for, for uh, many, many hours as these missions took. So mostly the bomb aimer, when he wasn't required to be over here, would just move around the aircraft and, and see what he can do. All right, so we have two more positions coming up. The dorsal gunner position and the tail uh, gunner. And that one I'm really looking forward to. What we're going to do now is I'm going to put a camera on my, uh, my, my forehead, try to get up there and show you guys how much of a tight squeeze it is actually to get into these turrets. Keep in mind, I'm roughly six foot, so that's a meter 90, um, and I was not designed to be operating a turret like this. Okay, so to get into this position right here, you actually have to lift up this part of the turret. Um, but as you do that, you essentially have to go inside the turret already. So we're going to go hands first, push ourselves up. Oy, 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 oy. And now we find ourselves stuck. What we have to do now is lift one leg onto the wrist, lift the other leg, and then somehow find a way to squeeze my overly sized body into this position Whew. and once you're on in here it really is quite nice we've got the gunner position with his quad 303 brownings uh, these are obviously replicas at this moment and he really has a nice little overview over there we can uh, see the navigators observation dome that's pretty nice they can wave at each other and beyond that, well, we're not in the sky, but it's a beautiful and actually quite comfortable position. And the way that it is, with the joystick here, is actually pretty, pretty cool. Getting out of it, though, is somewhat of a nightmare. So let's try it out. To get out, I have to stand up. I then have to lift the part that I'm sitting on and then sort of drop into the never hoping I don't bang myself and then just fall through the position and I'm out all right so the last position I'm dreading this one the tail gunner got my silly hat on my silly camera I'm trying to fit in there my cameraman tried it before me. He's about a head smaller than me, shorter, rather. He fits me. We'll see. Right, so the way this is done, obviously without the parachute, the parachute would be right here uh, to, uh, to the left when he comes out, to the right of the aircraft. And the way to get in to this position, oh, let's see how this is done. Okay, my body is in, that's good. However, I still have to get my leg 
somehow squeeze there we go there we go and i'm in very nice little position there's the gun side right there here's the uh, joystick for the guns once again you've got quad uh browning 303s this is a bold bolton bolton pole turret um we actually got this one from the french and the 30s and improved it now one of the things that happens while you're actually in operation in this station you have to close these doors right here i'm not going to do that right now but these fold inwards like so from both uh, sides and they are closed during flight so you're actually cut off from anything that goes on in the in the main part of the aircraft now you might now ask the question if the plane gets hit, if it's on fire, what does the tail gunner do? Well, he pushes open these panels and then he has to get out somehow because he has to get to this parachute. There's a little bit of a fire extinguisher here. He can try to fight the fire, I guess. But usually by the time he's out, that's not going to be an option anymore. Anyway, he has his, his parachute here. He has to get to that. There's a little bit of an axe here, which he can maybe use to pry open the uh the, the panels if they're stuck and then somehow obviously he's not going to care about getting out here without destroying anything i do so this is going to be a very difficult maneuver oh i don't know how to do this one second i have an idea <sighs> <laughs> you know, I'm regretting my words that I said earlier when I was having a laugh at my cameraman uh, during that wireless operator shoot. But look, oh my god, the plane is on fire and I'm finally out of the position. I can take the parachute, I can put it on. And if I can go that way into the escape hatch, which by the time I'm finally ready is possible, I will have to move back into this turret, rotate it 90 degrees to either side, and then bail out the open hatches. So yeah, have fun being Hale and Charlie. Now, if you're lucky, you will leave this aircraft the old fashioned way by just getting out of the entry hatch together with all your mates. And there we are, back from a successful mission of the Halifax. Now I hope you guys enjoyed this video more than I enjoyed getting out of that tail gunner's position. And if you did, check out the, our Patreon page down below in the description box. It's the support of Patreons that uh, actually allows us to travel to these museums, set up shots like this and bring it to your living room. As always, I hope you guys have a great day, good hunting and see you in the sky.